Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 721. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's February 25th, 2022. All right, people, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. Uh, if you're new here, this is basically where Kevin and George sit down in front of our webcams and talk about Anglican news. Sometimes we get to talk about Christian news as, as welcome as Anglican news. And sadly, every once in a while, we have to talk about the politics and maybe invasions happening around the world. And yeah, we're going to do that today. But before we get there, George, how's your week going? Pretty good. Uh... Our daughter's been visiting with us. We're preparing for closing on our house. We uh, go to settlement on Tuesday of next week. So mm -hmm. pins and needles, Kevin, to make sure everything's done right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, yeah, you said your your daughter was in India for a while, and she's back here visiting you in Florida. Now she, where's she off to? She is starting a new job at a psychiatric hospital in the Bay Area, in, uh, actually in San Leandro, which is south of uh, Oakland. She's a psychiatric nurse and she's a con she's a travel nurse and so she'll she loves that life because she'll work for three to six months at a place and then have three to six months off and then she'll travel and she spent two months in India uh, and now starts a new job and and uh, she has lots of friends in the Bay Area and the Silicon Valley from the university and uh, San Leandro and Oakland are not the Bay but uh, she can commute there. Uh, but she's looking for an apartment in San Francisco, and she's reading to me these ads to me. You know, a one uh, a studio, not even a one bedroom, but a studio, thirty five hundred dollars a month. Uh, oh my, my goodness, uh, oh, you know, a, a nice a, a nice apartment, four or five thousand dollars. So sharing a nice two bedroom apartment with another girl. Mm -hmm. You know, she'll have to come up with three thousand dollars a month. Now, as a travel nurse, she can afford that. Now, that's not going to be like twice our mortgage. Yeah. But, <laughs> but you know, we're here in Hooterville, which does not have the attractiveness of to young people that San Francisco does. No, you're, you're not in the Silicon <laughs> so. Valley for sure. Um, so let's talk. I asked you guys to pray for my uh, cataract. I went and saw an eye surgeon, that one of the top eye surgeons in all of Florida. And she was very pleased with the size of the cataract because she doesn't get to work on such a bad cataract. So she's excited, and I'm going to have this taken out on March 10th. I think that's the right date. Uh, so if you guys can keep playing for that, praying for that. She also says, I qualify to have new cornea lenses put in, so I don't need to wear glasses anymore. But I'm like, you know, you guys are so used to glasses. Do, do, what I, do I look good like this, George? Do it? Look at those little beady eyes. I don't know. No, 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 Kevin. Think now you can shop and buy at the mall at the Sunglass Hut and buy all these teenagers' sunglasses and Ray Bans and yeah. Wayfarers and oh, all the back, things that go back to Oakley that glasses you and I. Yeah. Well, you know all these things that we can't buy because we're blind as bats. <laughs> Oh boy, so let's move on and talk about the news. The biggest story clearly uh, right now is the Ukraine. Uh, Russia has been threatening to invade the Ukraine uh, for more than six weeks. Uh, Putin lined up 125,000 troops uh, outside the border with Belarus and Russia. And lo and behold, on Wednesday, he started to invade. And uh, I would say at least 60% uh, of his army is into Ukraine right now. And I want to talk about how this you know we, we don't have time to talk about the geopolitical nature of all this but kind of the church and how it's affecting the church and the response from church leaders especially the orthodox who are in the ukraine uh, the anglicans the catholics and let's just start there george responses to the invasion well i i think we should because this is a fast moving story give mm -hmm. people a sense of as we're recording what's happening now okay because we may be totally totally <laughs> right and totally totally wrong by the time this reaches the, our viewers as we speak uh there are reports on the uh in the news services that the russian special forces at the antonon airport on the suburbs of kiev mm -hmm. 
that the uh, that the city the capital is going to fall within uh, 24 to 36 hours that the uh, Russian columns are advancing basically not unopposed but the Russians have adopted the tactics used by the US in the Iraq wars of shock and awe targeted attacks on uh, defense installations, airfields, communications centers. And so the Russians now essentially have control of the airspace because they took out a lot of the air force or prevented the, the runways from being usable. And their early, fo you know, the early Twitter, you know, pictures of uh, people driving past long columns of Ukrainian tanks that were heading towards the front that are all burning because over the horizon missiles took out good deal of the Ukrainian armor. And now, of course, we don't see anything from the Russian side. So the Russians may be suffering 10 times as worse. We don't know. But there are a lot of what I call fog of war silly stories. There was one wire service story saying that the Russians are shelling the, ch the remains of the Chernobyl nuclear factory. No, the Russians are not that stupid. No, come yeah, on now. But uh, no, they're not, but they have retaken that area. Uh, you know, They've had... taken that area, but <laughs> they sort of have gone around it yes. and basically said to the Ukrainians, you may hide there, but Absolutely. we are going around. <laughs> Seizing Chernobyl, I can basically guarantee you, is not one of Putin's aims. No. So it's it looks like short of some miracle on the uh, on the Dnieper River uh, or the Don River this is going to be over very shortly and Ukraine will be under the uh, thumb of Putin mm -hmm. so that's what it looks like at this moment um, the Germans have uh, basically vetoed any active NATO uh, involvement which I think is to the relief of everybody mm -hmm. so that allows people to basically say oh well I think we should fight knowing that the Germans are holding us back. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the situation that is as we speak on the ground. And friends, this could all be totally backwards because we only, you know, we're not there. We don't know. We're not there and we're relying on first reports. First reports, uh, according to Kevin and George, are always incorrect. Um, and we had the fog of war. Uh, we're, right now we, we, the, we're, uh, we're, we're working with Pravda level Russia giving us information and uh, Ukrainian level Reuters trying to give us their information. Uh, both will be biased and both will be very un unfair in the reporting. Uh, Natalie, Natalia, uh, used to be our bookkeeper until she had a baby and she went out uh, six months ago. Mm -hmm. But she's still a member of the congregation. Natalia is a Ukrainian, um, married an American and uh, is, you know, is a Ukrainian lawyer who uh, wound up in Hooterville, Florida here. She's in her early 30s and she has uh, lost contact with her mother and brother in the Ukraine uh, be uh, because the Russians have uh, not only engaged a uh, uh, military strike, there's a cyber war going on. So the cell phone service is out large portions of the Ukraine and so uh, internet connections basically are non-existent except in by satellite. So the so that this the war is a war not only of tanks, but it's a war uh, where what are the what, I don't know the name of the weapon, but the weapon that basically takes out electronics, mm -hmm. and it's more than just blowing up the cell phone tower. It's taking out. Uh, the electronics infrastructure of your enemy uh, in the uh, contested areas. So it's we're we're looking at a new type of war. Yeah, we are. Well, not, I, I wouldn't say a new type of invasion. I, a war has to have two pretty strong opposing sides here. Uh, the, nobody is fighting for Ukraine except in, in verbiage uh, and orally. We saw President Biden give a speech yesterday, and I'm like, what? He's just invited. China to invade Taiwan because they're not going to oppose this in a military way and they had Germany uh, say no we're not going to allow you to keep Russia out of SWIFT 
If you took uh, Russia and China out of SWIFT, you have such great financial restrictions over them that that would be a game changer. What's SWIFT, Kevin? I don't think all of our viewers uh, know SWIFT what SWIFT is. SWIFT is the international uh, exchange uh, for finances. It allows Russian banks to work with American banks, American banks to work with Chinese banks. Uh, it, it's the, the SWIFT exchange. And uh, if, you, if you forbade Russia and you forbade China and any uh, modern country, uh, it would be financially devastating to them, especially yeah, Russia. Yeah, I mean, you're, if you're... Russia gets income you know, from selling oil. If you're not allowed to, to, to trade at the, on the Zwift market for your oil, you're, you're broke. And your credit cards don't work in Russia, and your yeah. ATM card doesn't work in Russia, and your the whole it's uh, it was the proposal put forward by Boris Johnson, but the Germans, the, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, this is what we should do. But the Germans said no, and uh, the Biden administration basically said yes and no. Uh, they were as clear as mud on this point. <laughs> well, so, I, but I I want to look at this from you know a Kevin and George perspective. If you remember two years ago, uh, Georgia changed their voting rights uh, laws for who could vote in Georgia, and, and they kind of returned it to, uh, they strengthened the law to you know, pretty much in line with Connecticut. Connecticut has very strict voter uh, guidelines, and you have to show your ID uh, to vote and stuff like that. So Georgia moved into line with Connecticut. Hollywood, Pepsi, Federal Express, baseball, basketball, NFL, all came down really hard on Georgia. How dare you uh, make it so people can't vote? And said, we're not going to have the NBA play in Georgia anymore. We're not going to have the, the National uh, Baseball Hall of Fame game there anymore. And Hollywood said, we're not going to make movies there anymore. Well, if memory serves, Russia is much more anti-voting rights and much more anti-LGTBQ than Georgia ever was. I don't see Hollywood saying boo about this. I don't see Federal Express saying we're not going to deliver packages to Russia. I don't see no. Pepsi or anybody else no, saying we're leaving Russia. That's not fair, Kevin. Major League Baseball said it will not hold the All-Star game next year in Kiev. <laughs> it's okay. Well, there you go. Or Moscow. <laughs> Moscow. Moscow is now off. <clears throat> the Moscow. Uh, oh, my. But... Uh, I just wanted to point out the hypocrisy here. You know, the hypocrisy is uh, the soft totalitarianism offered by corporate America. Whenever they see something they don't like, they'll go in there and refuse to do business. They refuse to bake cakes, so well, to you speak. Know. You know, and so... Well, the, the you know the NBA and LeBron James are the example number one. Yeah, of China. You know, the, and this, these these sneakers and athletic shoes touted by these stars are made by slave labor camp, made in slave labor camps in uh, in Western China. So, but it's it's such a serious issue that people of consequence who have real money involved are keeping their mouths shut to see how things evolve. Mm -hmm. It's easy to make a cheap statement. I'm not going to film a f make a film a movie in it, Georgia. Well, were you going to do it anyway, you know? Uh, it's like saying Major League Baseball is canceling its spring season in Kiev and Moscow, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, no big deal. Well, so uh, here corporate, Tim corporate Cook, world is waiting to see how things are going now. Yeah, Tim Cook and Apple have 13 or 14 different Apple stores in Russia. Are they going to close them tomorrow? Hell no. If China invaded Taiwan, would Apple close their 40 stores in China? No. Absolutely not. We want the long-term financial benefit of being in China, where there are billions of future iPhone customers. You know, we'll, we'll take the, the political hit and stay there, uh, regardless of the geopolitical nature of what's happening. Well, ExxonMobil has billions and billions invested in the Russian oil industry. Mm -hmm. Alcoa, the aluminum company, banks have billions le invested and lent to Russian lenders. So it, it's not something that is amenable to uh, 
people are people can talk right now because the Germans have essentially said no meaningful sanction. If you can find Vladimir Putin's car parked on the side of the road in Western Europe, you can tow it. Give him a ticket, a little parking ticket. Yes. You can give him a ticket, <laughs> and he's got thirty days to pay it, or you could, or they'll reduce, or they'll tow it away. That's the extent of the sanctions that will be working out. Um, the I'll take this tiny different direction. Nick Baines is the uh, Bishop of Leeds uh, in the Church of England. Uh, Nick Baines uh, spoke, you know, was, was trained as a Russian speaker and worked in RAF intelligence as a young man. And he's, he's had an interest in Eastern Europe and these affairs for going on many, many years. He uh, gave an interview to uh, a new outfit, the Religion Media Center, which is uh, basically a new group in England that's uh, sort of trying to mimic the religion news service where he talked about uh, the the war and said essentially this is a religious war it's a civil war between orthodoxy and a war with the Vatican and now there's a bit of hyper there's a lot of hyperbole there but it's the same level of hyperbole that you and I engage in essentially he's in the right direction mm -hmm. um, Moscow, Putin is coming at this in a in a perfect. If you, again, I'm not. Let me say up front, I am not defending what he's doing. I, I think it's a terrible thing what he's done. But if we need to talk, but for us to talk about this, we need to faithfully explain his reasons. That doesn't mean we agree with him. Mm -hmm. But if, if you need to understand, you want to know where he's coming from. But for Vladimir Putin, he Vladimir Putin and his generation of Russian leaders, the fall of the Soviet Union, and the subsequent events of uh, Czechoslovakia, the Czech Republic, and Poland, Romania, Hungary, all joining NATO, they feel the way the Ger German nationalists did after the Versailles Treaty. Vladimir Putin hates people saying that Russia lost the Cold War. They didn't lose the Cold War. The KGB didn't lose the Cold War. The, the Russian army was never defeated in battle, yet they're portrayed as losers. And the great achievement of Russia, of a world power, was destroyed and went from a bipolar world with Russia and the United States and their allies to a unipolar war with the United States and everybody else. And for Vladimir Putin, that is so, makes, that is, that's the th that's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's unfair, and he has been working to recreate not a new Soviet Union, meaning an atheist communist state, but a greater Russia, if you will, a Russian empire, as it was under the czars. Well, he he's trying to so, remake his his version of the motherland. Okay, no, yes. he doesn't want to return to the old Soviet uh, atheism as much as he wants to re return to. Uh, our pride is in our geography. Our pride is in our motherland. So if you're Vladimir Putin and you look and see the three Baltic republics, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, they're now part of NATO. Right. Uh, all, the Warsaw Pact nations are all part of NATO. Um, and NATO re and NATO recently has been talking to Georgia, uh, not Atlanta, Georgia, but <laughs> Rus Russian sure. yeah. in the Caucasus and the Ukraine about joining NATO. Vladimir Putin sees this as the way John F. Kennedy in the United States saw Russia putting, Khrushchev putting missiles in Cuba. Uh, 90 miles off the coast of America are is the means to destroy our country that we can't do anything about. We need buffer zones, meaning we don't want the Russians in this hemisphere. The Russians don't want NATO, which they see as the United States, on their borders. It's bad enough that the Baltic states, but to have Georgia and Ukraine, which were always loyal parts, Stalin was a Georgian, uh, Khrushchev was a Ukrainian, to have them flip sides is intolerable. So Vladimir Putin, you know, was been working, he's been, he's been head of Russia for 20 years, and he's been going in the same direction all along. Uh, six years ago, uh, was it six years under eight years ago when he invaded Crimea? He took Crimea. 
Now, the argument was, well, Crimea was always part of Russia. It was just Khrushchev who gave it to the Ukraine, blah, blah, Correct, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Mm -hmm. That was under Obama administration. Mm -hmm. And if you remember at the time, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey said this was intolerable and the Russians must withdraw from the Crimea. Well, uh, and they did, was right? So, no, he was so scared. <laughs> he was so scared by Catherine Jeffrey Shorey that he waited till now. And after he, after he annexed the, Russia annexed the Crimea, uh, they slapped down Georgia with the same sort of war they had against the Ukraine, basically came in, totally overwhelmed him, put in a pro-Russian government. And now there's no more talk in Georgia about joining NATO and NATO's not extending the invitation. In the Obama administration, the United States government uh, basically sponsored a coup where a pro-Moscow a fit corrupt government was placed replaced by a pro-american corrupt government mm -hmm. now none of these people uh, well, i would say more pro what more pro europe than pro us but well um and if you remember all the news shots of joe biden going over saying i told the russians that they weren't the ukrainians they weren't going to get the billion dollars unless they stopped this prosecution of my son now you need to put that into a larger prospect of the new government's put into power Mm -hmm. that is pro-Western, and they're stopping the investigations of uh, Hunter Biden on corruption and theft charges. So there's wheels within wheels within wheels. Now, for, so for Putin, he first starts by annexing the Donbass and Lukash regions of eastern Ukraine, which are predominantly Russian. And it's the same arguments and the same mindset that Hitler had when he annexed the Sudetenland, those parts of Czechoslovakia that were predominantly German. And, these and are areas... Hitler assured everybody, I'm just, this is where I'm going to stop. These, these are Germans. We're, we're bringing them back into the motherland, the Rhineland. We'll stop there. Trust me. Putin does not consider the Ukrainian to be a separate nation. Correct. He considers them the way we Floridians consider people from New England or Texans. We're all the same country, but <laughs> Texans are foreigners to me, man. That's right. <laughs> uh, 20, big, big hair, pointy boots, mm -hmm. uh, or you people in New England, who ooh, ooh, <laughs> you're not like us. Carpet baggers, you call us. Yeah. And uh, I've got some people from Maine in my congregation, and they English spoken in Maine is as different from the English spoken in Florida as the Russians are from the Ukrainians. I'm being yeah. silly, but no, that's true. That's the mindset of Vladimir Putin that yeah. he is not taking a foreign country. These aren't Poles. These aren't Lithuanians or Latvians. The Ukrainians are part of the greater Rus. And here's where the religion comes in. Historically, that Rus was defined by Orthodoxy, Russian Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And Kirill, Patriarch Kirill, has been fighting a battle with a breakaway Ukrainian Orthodox Church in the Ukraine. And this is the one that is supported by Bartholomew, the Ecumenical Patriarch. It's also supported by the Ukrainian government. So there are two Ukrainian churches, and it's almost, it's as bitter as an Episcopal Church versus ACNA fight at the harshest, dirtiest, darkest times, fighting over property, fighting over parishioners, clergy going from one to the other. But the difference being that this time the Episcopal Church has tank divisions in addition to lawyers. And so there's the battle, as well as the Greek Catholic Church led by uh, Arch, greater Archbishop uh, Sviatoslav Sevchuk. And these these are the people who are uh, uh, uniet, or they don't like that phrase, but they are Orthodox under the authority of the Pope. They're mostly in Western Ukraine. And the fights between Russia and the Vatican are over these units. So the Russian national religious body is entirely in line with the Russian political agenda of recreating greater Russia. I'm not saying this is right, I'm not saying no. this is good, but this is what they're thinking. And it, because so, th there is a plan here. You know, if, if we have Putin and Putin wants to start retaking some of this, no, he's not rebuilding the USSR, but if he wants to start retaking things, we're part of this because 
it helps the church. Now it does help the church. I, I want to talk about some of the, re the reactions, though. Metropolitan Hilleran, what's he, what's he say about all this? He used to be anti-war. Uh, was it twenty seventeen? Yeah. Uh, you gave you gave me that you sent this link. Yeah, to I me, sent Gavin. this link. Twenty seventeen. Yeah. Hilleran, uh, basically saying that uh, war is not the answer; it's yeah. negotiation, peace. Yeah, first, Hillary Ann said in, in a quote, first of all, we must not allow war. And when one hears, once again, calls for the war, the militistic rhetoric, including for the, the mouth of the church representatives, and he goes on to his, you know, uh, explains, these are, of course, totally absurd. We cannot have war. I think he's changed his mind now. Yes, he has. Uh, uh, Two weeks ago, we reported on Hilarion being awarded the Order of Alexander Nevsky by Putin. Uh, there's a little picture of him with the, the medal and shaking the hands. And Hilarion, who is essentially the number two, he's the head of the Department of Ex External Church Relations. And he's uh, metropolitan of, I believe, Volkonsk, I'm not certain which. Uh, he, he's, an, he's the equivalent of an archbishop or a cardinal uh, in the Russian world. He. Uh, essentially is uh, defending this action as protecting and promoting orthodoxy against a decadent West. See, this is a religious, in the hearts and minds side, how this is being played in some sections of the Orthodox Church in Russia. I'm not saying all, but in some sections, Western secularism, Western liberalism, Western pro-gay agenda is a cancer on society that is spreading east and the russian government is standing tall and faithful against this destruction of civilization the russian government in the person of vladimir putin and his armies so i'm interpreting hilarian's words i don't Gen know general and generalizing you know th yeah, this is I'm not general. a quote not verbatim this is how people like hilarian think about the nationalism of Russia that is preserving the church. So, so like one of the first, you know, Kevin, you had that little joke about uh, at the start of the show that Russia invades Ukraine, gays, lesbians, and minorities first, you know, impacted most. most. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in the, in the Donbass and Lukash uh, statelets that uh, were formerly annexed, uh, one of the uh, few news items that came out were uh, Forum 18, which is a news service that reports on Christian persecution in the former Soviet Union, reports that all non-Russian Moscow Orthodox Cong churches have been closed. Protestant churches, as well as Ukrainian Orthodox churches. The only churches allowed are the Russian Orthodox Church. And these are not, there's no real theological difference between, between the Ukrainian and the Russian Orthodox Church. They're not fighting over transubstantiation. It's national identity. And Protestantism, though not as bad as secular liberalism, is still a foreign import that is sapping the Russia. And see, uh, years ago, I attended a World Council of Churches meeting in Brazil as a reporter, and I sat next to the uh, we had seats in the press gallery, and I sat next to a man, Vesevalo Chiplin, who was from Moscow. He was uh, uh, an assistant to, at that time, Kirill, who held Hilarion's job. And Vesevalo Chiplin was a character. He was a real character. Uh, uh, every time a Protestant would get up under his breath, he would say in English, for my benefit and the other reporters, heretic. Uh, schismatic yes. um, and you know in casual conversation man's perfectly fluent in English casual conversations he believes that the third Jerusalem is Moscow hmm. you know after the fall of Constantinople the center of Christian life on this earth where God wants his church to be centered moved to Moscow and it is God's mission for the Russian Orthodox Church 
to be that force that brings Christ to the world in the right way, which is Russian Orthodoxy. Now, you and I may giggle at this sort of Boris Badenov character, but there is a very strong strain within the Russian church and the Russian government about this. And Vladimir Putin, uh, civil plane lost some internal fights with people and it's sort of out of favor, but Chaplin was very much uh, leading the charge to have Putin declare himself the Tsar. Could Another you words, imagine? Let's get rid of you did, I know. No, let's get. No, let's. There was a push by ultra conservative Russian mm -hmm. Orthodox after they made uh, Nicholas and Alexandra saints martyrs to communism. See, these mm -hmm. people are virulently anti communist, anti atheist, yes, which they view as a Jewish Western import. Uh, this is why you have a rise of what we call neo-fascism uh, in Russia, because they view the Jews as being responsible for communism, these people. Chaplin and his allies wanted Putin to declare himself to be the czar, which is God's, if you will, ruler, representative of on earth alongside the church. So these things are these are the sort of mindsets and preconditions now you and i attending an episcopal church where michael curry says something i go yeah who cares uh michael who? it's <laughs> it's a different world justin willie thinks we should do what yeah, maybe not it's a different world when you see god blessing the the czar god giving order to this world to his leaders again this is a minority view within orthodoxy, orthodoxy. yeah I'm not saying i'm not saying all the orthodox you know in the united states i think this way hardly any of them would but within russia there's a very strong strain along this side mm -hmm. Th and this is where P P putin has used this to his advantage you know one of the struggles they had when the cold, cold war ended was yeah, communism was eradicated from you know many of the uh, countries that were able to leave the Soviet Union, but Russia itself remained communist and remained a secret state and remained um, controlled by uh, the the KGB and other organizations that that kept that alive. And we thought, you know, just our influence as Westerners, and now that they have TV and they can watch Dallas and other shows, they will want, they'll fall in love with capitalism, they'll fall in love with freedom. But no, they elected Putin uh, as a, his initial leader. He was never reelected, he, he kept the power. But if they had kept, kept a Yeltsin or kept a Gorbachev, yes, they would have eventually become a Westernized nation. But Putin was hard-headed and did not ever want to see uh, that type of capitalism exist in Russia. I think I'll, I think I'll bicker with you on this point. You know, um, I do. You, you know more about Russia than I do. <clears throat> Russia is a capitalist nation, but it's a, and it was under, it was under Yeltsin that Russia was a kleptocracy. Correct. Where, but I want to call it the, capitalist as much as black market. Where and one of the re and Putin has been reelected. Putin is popular. Mm -hmm. um, he has submitted to the will of the people and been reelected many, many times. But he jails uh, his he, he jails his competitors. Yeah, but still, that's popular. <laughs> uh, Justin Trudeau jails his competitors. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, okay, we yeah. have uh, well, yeah. we have points of reference here, um, but with Putin, Putin sort of cleaned up the place. And I have friends who've, uh, I, I know a guy, an American who's lived in Moscow for 20 years, and he says, under Putin, there's much more freedom, there's much more, it's not perfect, it's far from it, but I, there is more freedom, the, but there's no more political freedom. Right, there, but it's, it's it, not a two party system or a three party system. It's still, you know, you are you are there to serve the party. Not the Communist Party, though. The Communist Party is in opposition. Um, it's more like South Korea was in the 60s or 70s, or maybe Singapore. Uh, mm -hmm. People in Singapore would get mad at me. But it's an authoritarian capitalist state. 
uh, but uh, we're, I think we're getting a feel uh, of farther uh, field. But, yeah. but the, the, point be, the point being is that Putin is in no danger of being kicked out. He's very popular. He's popular as a nationalist. He's popular because he's viewed as being clean compared mm -hmm. to Yeltsin. Uh, he's compared to Gorbachev. Gorbachev threw away the greatest empire the world had known, many Russians say. Absolutely. And you have to remember that Stalin is still considered fondly by many Russians, mm -hmm. even though he caused the deaths of millions upon millions. That having been said, where does Kirill come out on all this? Well, before uh, Kirill released a statement uh, yesterday, which we brought put out on Anglican. And I put out several statements, and before the war broke out, uh, the Church of England released a prayer penned by, I think it was under Justin Welby's name, but it may have been penned by somebody, that was very popular on our website. We had many, 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 many viewers who read that, read that on Anglican Inc. War broke out. Kirill st releases a statement. Sviatoslav, the, the Greek Catholic, Sviatoslav releases a statement. The Pope releases a statement, which I haven't put up, because uh, there's plenty of places to find that. And Justin Welby and Stephen Cottrell put up a statement. And once the prayer statement, the Anglicans, very well received in terms of viewership. And there is an Anglican church in Kiev, mind uh -huh. you. Uh, meets in the Lutheran church, because the old Anglican church was taken away at the revolution and then destroyed by the Germans in World War II. A long time ago. But, but the Anglican Church, there are Anglicans in Kiev. But the statements by the Archbishop of Canterbury and Stephen Cottrell compared to Kirill, Kirill, and that ours is an Anglican channel web service, Kirill had at the latest count 30 times as many readers as well being Cottrell. Sviatoslav Sevchuk. The Greek Catholic, and I think 90% of our viewers would have no idea what the Greek Catholic was, has at least 20 times the readership. Justin Welby, well, that we've entered in his political, his prayerful statements, very well received, well read. His political protests, nobody cares. When he acts like the Sea of Canterbury should act, people are like, yes, they engage and they share it. It's not just that they read it, they share it with other people so they would read it. That's how the, the viewership of these things grow. Um, but when you make the Church of England uh, irrelevant, when you make the, the office of the Archbishop of Canterbury irrelevant, you're going to get the 45 views uh, in 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they got a little more than that on Anglican Inc. But, <laughs> yeah, just... uh, but, but the, the content of the statements are interesting, too. Mm -hmm. Kirill, mind you now, believes that there... Kirill is an even-handed statement, praying for peace, praying for an end of war, not pumping up Putin, not pumping, putting down the Ukrainian government of Zelensky, but rather basically opening his arms to all orthodox believers for peace so in essence Kirill is opening the doors to absorb the ukrainian church and he's not trying to uh alienate them by nasty statements supporting putin outright nor is he condemning putin so some people in our comments section on uh, anglican inc and on facebook and other places are quite upset that Kirill is not use the language of Justin Welby and Stephen Cottrell, who called this wicked. Mm -hmm. Now, Sviatoslav, but if you wanted a really good statement, Sviatoslav Sevchuk, the Greek Catholic bishop, archbishop, is saying that he's calling the West to rally to the defense of the Ukraine because the Ukraine is a bulwark against the, the totalitarian authoritarian East. It's a preserver of European religious and cultural values. Um, Sevchuk is not a liberal by any 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 uh, nation, yes, any things. But Sevchuk is on the same wavelength that Hilarion is, except they're on different sides. Hilarion is saying that the Greek Catholics and the uh, the Lutherans and the Anglicans, the Church of England, all these people, they've succumbed to the spirit of the age of liberalism, and Sevchuk is responding. The Russian Orthodox Church 
has succumbed to the spirit of the Russian age of being authoritarian, anti-democratic, strongman church, fully Erastian, fully in the grips of Vladimir Putin. So there is, so, so Nick Baines is right. There is a religious war going on. Um, and Bartholomew, the ecumenical patriarch, put out a statement, which I have to put up, but I haven't done it yet condemning the invasion of very strong terms. But Kirill's one is the real, if, if you want to look at this sort of from a, a, I don't want to say wise view, but some from the heights, see where he's going. Kirill's statement is of pastoral concern, but it's also a statement in preparation to absorbing the breakaway Ukrainian church. He's basically, be, uh, the Russian government will behead the Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox leadership and Carol is basically saying to the clergy and their parishes and parishioners, okay, fun's over, come back to your true home and we will build the kingdom of Christ for greater Russia and the world. And that's that's the church perspective here uh, in Russia. So what to see... And, you know, and now there are actually people who are more conservative than Vladimir Putin in the Russian government. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they point out in the Duma is that Zelensky is a Jew. The Ukrainian leader, prime minister, is a Jew. And so you get all the Russian, not all, but you get some of the Russian hatred, yes. Some of the Russian anti anti-Semitism yeah. is coming out against the Ukrainian prime. So, and the, and the things that we read, yeah, we there's a lot of religion going on. You won't see it in CNN or Fox, but the religious elements are quite there. No. Okay, well, we and just... And again, that's just where we are today. Who knows what happens tomorrow? Maybe <laughs> yeah, the Pope the... and his legions will come, and uh, <laughs> so... the Archangel Michael will appear before the city of uh, Kiev. And, oh, and friends, yes, I know the different ways to pronounce Kiev. You call it Kiev, Kiev. Um... Kevin and I are rather rotund middle-aged men who enjoy Chicken Kiev, and we're not Kiev. going to. I'm not going to change uh, that. Ain't going to change it. Change, change our way of speaking all these years. <laughs> Kiev is the Ukrainian pronunciation. Kiev mm -hmm. is the Russian pronunciation, mm -hmm. and we do not say this just to promote the re russification It's just how we were brought up. When my professor, Mr. Burroughs, in sophomore high school, I took the Russia Chinese history class. He pronounced it Kiev. Therefore, many years later, I pronounce it Kiev as well. And I'm sure George suffers from the same fate. You know, it's just it's the way we're brought up. Um, well, George, I think that's almost a complete episode just covering Ukraine. Let's cover one of the other uh, four stories we had. We can save stuff for Tuesday. Um, I kind of like the the Diocese of London one. It's going to be probably the best, or the Perth. Which one do you want to do? Uh, David Old's got the corner on Perth, okay. so let's do London because okay. he, he can speak to that more clearly than we can. So the globe has just suffered through a pandemic called coronavirus for two years. There's a war breaking out in between Russia and Ukraine and, and probably some other countries in the next uh, six years. What's the most important thing the Diocese of London could put out this week, George? Well, the Diocese of London has inaugurated an LGBT plus advisory group. Because it is, after all, LGBT plus history month in England. Oh, in America, it's Black History it's Black History Month in America, but it's LGBT Q, Q or R S T U V W X plus, Y Z plus plus asterisk history asterisk. Month. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. And the Diocese of London put out a statement yesterday saying this month, uh, and they remind us it is Gay History Month, uh -huh. is a, quote, an ex special opportunity to give thanks for the extraordinary contribution of LGBT plus people to the life of the church and the world. Okay. And then they want to say, but this comes at a time when LGBT plus people are acutely aware of not being loved. Therefore, the Church of England and the Diocese of London is setting up a committee uh, 
led by an archdeacon and a priest to advise the church on how to incorporate fully gay people into the life of the diocese. Well, there have been gay bishops in the diocese of London. I, I, suffering I, 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 and it's, you this think, is a very, on based on people on the ground, clergy on the ground, and bishops on the ground in the Church of England, this is one of the most irrelevant uh, organizations ever put together um, because there's gay bishops, gay clergy, gay deacons, gay deans uh, all over the Church of England. Um, th this Diocese and, of London is just late to the party. Well, yeah. Colin Coward told me a few years ago that London has the highest concentration, concentration yes, of, of gay clergy. <laughs> yes, of gay clergy. This is for gay marriage or anything, but. Basically, and they cite the Ozan Foundation, which is a hard left activist group that seeks to to destroy, destroy any opposition, orthodoxy, and tradition yeah. within the Church of England. Absolutely, and expel them from the church and remove them from the life. So you've got the radical activists basically driving this advisory group. Now, there. Let's. How, why is this appearing on the day of the Russian invasion? Bad luck, bad, bad press luck. in the Diocese of London. I mean, just not the thing to put out that day. Uh, you know, because it is actually, they should have retitled it. Instead of saying, we celebrate Gay History Month in light of the poor attack on gay people in Kiev by Moscow. What, what a mess. They could have used I, that book. That, a big hit and a miss. I mean, gays and blacks affected worse by the Ukrainian invasion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, what's going on here? Is it the last gasp of a defeated team? They see their see the times running out, and they just want to get their words out and their point out before the whole show is over. Or do they know that it's in the bag? They don't have to hide it anymore. That the LLF living in love and faithfulness process on where the Church of England talks about you know where we're going to have gayness in the church they know what the outcome is they know that it's all going to be regularized and they're just putting in place the administrative and uh pr uh teams to capitalize on their eventual victory later this yeah, year what this says is they don't care what happens mm -hmm. just like the episcopal church we're going to make it happen anyway we're not going to wait for general convention. We're not going to wait for the reports. We're not going to wait for the diocese to come around our way. We're going to start acting and consecrating and installing the people we want to install, uh, even though they suffer from uh, gender dysphoria or say some same-sex attraction. Uh, we're going to be uh, promoting this in our church, and damn be general convention, damn be uh, the synods, and this is the, the reaction to that. It just and this follows the uh, appointment of a partnered gay man as the archbishop's uh, appointment secretary, mm -hmm. a man whose lifestyle is in contradict contravention to the official doctrine and discipline of the Church of England. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They don't care uh, because they know they they want to get all their ducks in a row, uh, and now it's as good a time as any. Uh, maybe because of the distraction of the war, and nah, I don't even think they care about that. I just think it was Gay History Month, and that's all that counted. And they wanted to get it in before the end of the month. What a show, George. So, all right, do keep the nation of Ukraine while it still belongs to Ukraine in the next couple of days in your prayers. Uh, we, we pray that this uh, invasion does not kill uh, very many people. Uh, we pray that this would be a, a learning experience for NATO, a learning experience for the West, uh, as to preventing Taiwan from falling in the future. Although I don't think we can prevent that with the current administration. But that's political talk. We don't do that, George, do we? No. 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 I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Congan. You've been watching episode 721 of Anglican on the